now at Fitz University. <laughs> and so we've been... What is the better place? No. Fitz <laughs> <laughs> University. Yeah. So which is the better place? <laughs> Just answer the question. <laughs> which is the I'm, better place? I'm going to plead the fifth here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Bob, as you can see, he's an ecologist. He's uh, worked uh, particularly to do with savannas, and he's worked all over the world. I know he spent time in Costa Rica on places like that, in South America. He's also been to Antarctica. So like most of us, he takes his, you know, uses every opportunity to go to interesting and exotic places. And um, he, at that he's an A-rated scientist. He's published extensively. He's um, at CSR, he was on the Strategic Research Panel and a fellow of the CSR. And Nartwitz, as you can see, is a distinguished fellow here. But one of the jobs he's been given is to was to coordinate and run this, this group that was going to look at the, I could say, kind of an environmental impact assessment of uh, the development, exploration for the development and, of, of shale gas in the Karoo. So Bob did a very good job of that. I was one of the team members. I was in the little team that had to do with the, uh, looking at seismic risk. <laughs> Bob had heard the cats. So over to you, Bob. Yeah. Right. So, so this is, I think, the first uh, sort of formal presentation I've ever made holding a beer. I really, I'm, I'm very glad I didn't put a tie on. Someone did ask me whether this was a one drink or a two drink presentation. <laughs> it's as long as you want it to be. And I'm very happy um, for you to interrupt and you know um, disagree and debate or, or, or whatever. Not, not precious about that stuff at all. And what I'll try and do is probably just you know run through it in maybe half an hour or 35 minutes and then we can you know uh, talk about any you know thing that 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 that, that, that comes up uh, out of it. I probably especially in this audience need to explain you know how did I get this this job you know you the guys who know all about hydrocarbons and exploration and whatnot what is a you know what is a savannah ecologist doing running a um, an assessment of shale gas in the Peru well, w when this first thing first came to the, to the fore, the CSIR was trying to think about what was its role within the science landscape. You know, it, it's not a university, it's not a consultancy. What is its real job? And we decided that if we were to really fulfill our, our mission, what we actually had to be was a trusted advisor to government on, on big and difficult decisions. And so we were sort of pushing that line to government, and this fracking thing came up. And we said, like that one, you know, that's a difficult, multidisciplinary, you know, kind of socially important problem. That's the sort of thing that we can help you to uh, address. And it took us nearly three years to persuade government to let us do that. Okay, government doesn't like releasing decision-making power or authority. And we wanted to do this in a very different way. We didn't want to do a tick box public participation exercise. So it's not an EIA. It doesn't fit into that pattern at all. It fits into a pattern that we called uh, we call an assessment, a in this case a strategic assessment, which is a much more helicopter view and a much, much more in-depth transdisciplinary approach rather than even a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and so we, we had to persuade government to, to, to let us do that. And that involved them releasing an enormous amount of of control and power over this. For instance, we did a radical thing. We set up a group to supervise this, which included people from the sort of petroleum industry and people from the Save the Karoo, you know, around the same table to act as the referees, you know. And that government at first said, no, you can't possibly do that. You know, you know that, that just won't work. And, and, of course, you have to trust the process, and it does work. Um, Anyway, after a lot of discussion, the government agreed to do that. And the point is that I actually know, when I started this, I know nothing about either fracking or, or, or shale gas, but I do know about assessments. Okay, I have been involved in assessments of that source since the early 90s, first in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, doing the repeated climate change assessments, which is where we all learned how to do this, then with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Subsequently, I ran the assessment on elephant management in South Africa. Um, and uh, I've just recently completed the Global Land Degradation Assessment. So I know how assessments run and how to organize them and how to ensure that this incredibly noisy, divergent, polarized, you know, shouting at each other situation converges to a, to, to a point where you can actually make sensible decisions out of it. 
So, <coughs> of course, the question that everyone you know wants to know is, you know, is there is there gas you know, in, in the crew? And, and in fact, you know, um, in, in, again, in this in this audience, I hardly need to explain this that hardly just about anywhere in the world, if you dig a deep enough hole, some gas is going to come out. Okay, we know that from gold mining. We know that from all sorts of things. That there's always there's always gas. You know, when you go down. The real question is, is it sufficiently accessible and produced in sufficient volumes to be to be viable? Not whether there is or isn't gas. We know that there's gas uh, present in in the Karoo. Why? Because of the actual age of the of, 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 of the sediments there is absolutely in that period when hydrocarbons were accumulating all around the world of carboniferous. And where this was at the time was a shallow sedimentary basin where absolutely oil and gas should have been accumulating. And we know that the White Hill Formation, which is one of the key markers there, is this organic rich shale and those organic rich materials generate gas you know, over time. So, you know, all, all the indications were that there should be <coughs> gas there. And when Sukor drilled in the 70s looking for, for oil there, they didn't find any oil, but they did find, you know, a fair number of their of their holes produced gas. Yeah, even to the point where even today, you know, the, the holes are un, uncapped and the farmer will take you around and put a lighter there and <laughs> you'll get a flare, you know. So there's, there's gas there, you know, but whether it is actually a, a viable proposition is really the question. Yeah, as I say, there's there's all kinds of anecdotes, you know, sort of farmer stories. Oh no, there's this place on my farm where you know you can you can you can light the felt, and, you know, all this sort of stuff. So you know, this is, I usually have to explain very carefully to audiences about what is the difference between gas in place, which is what got everyone excited, the estimate from the, uh, the, energy, um, the Energy Agency of the United States, which did a you know, sort of a calculation, the Karoo's this big, okay, uh, the White Hill Formation is this thick, it has an organic carbon content of this many percent, multiply, 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 therefore there's this much gas there, okay, and you get this humongous number, which would make it like the fifth biggest, you know, sort of deposit in the world, when you know you sort of actually put applied a bit of rationality to that it sort of comes down to well not all of that can you get at and then when we finally set the sort of range that we're probably looking at it's somewhere down in that kind of region there and subsequent work suggests it's actually even uh, lower than that okay just to put that into context of course you know conventional gas the mozambique channel is about 75 trillion cubic feet so you know that's a that's a decent gas find you know in, in the global sense you know that's 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 something worth going after on the other hand we developed moss gas at 1 trillion cubic feet okay so even if there was at the bottom end of this 5 trillion cubic feet it still might be an interesting proposition not it's not going to change the world energy you know circumstances or even South Africa's energy circumstances but probably it would be worth looking at all right um, this is a north-south slice looking westwards through the Karoo, obviously greatly exaggerated. The Karoo basin is sort of uh, blocked off at the south end by the uh, uplifted uh, you know, Cape Fold Mountains and, uh, and it continues a long way of course to the north here. And as we go further north you get you know, much much more uh, dolerite dikes and soils intruding in order for there to be gas there it really has to be quite deep because if it's near the surface it's outgassed long ago okay so it's got to be deep it's got to be more than about two kilometers and so that means really this is kind of where we're looking um, and it's you know just this is the white hill formation which is just above the 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 the, 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 the glyca stuff so so that's what we're looking at in the sort of band through, through the great Karoo. <coughs> All right. So, but what we now know about the shale gas in the Karoo is that it's been baked out. Essentially, the dolerite, doloritic intrusions, which were associated with the sort of breakup of Gondwana land, cooked out most of the hydrocarbons. That's why there actually isn't any oil there. There really ought to be oil there. There isn't any oil that we can just discover there. It got cooked out. 
you know, so not only is there a loss of the gas, but its composition in terms of its, you know, carbon to hydrogen ratio, you know, suggests it's, it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's been heated up. <clears throat> even so, there may still be pockets where there's gas. You know, even if you have heated it and it's been volatilized, if it got trapped under some impervious layer, there could still be pockets of gas there. So you can't just simply say, well, the test rule holes we've you know done show there's very little gas and it's kind of not, not the right sort of gas that we want. There still may in fact be little bits uh, there. All right, so I probably don't need to explain much of this to you either, and that is that when you talk about conventional gas, what you're doing is you're drilling down into a reservoir, you know, where there's free gas in there, it's under some kind of pressure, so you just have to you know, stick a needle in it and out it comes, basically. Um, I'm probably radically simplifying there. <laughs> Whereas unconventional gas um, is, 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 is bound, bound into these organic, you know, containing uh, layers. And the amount, there, there's, not, there's not free gas there. So if you penetrate that layer, it doesn't come all rushing out. What you actually have to do is go down there and turn left okay and drill an enormously long distance along here and then shatter that so that all the gas that's tightly held within that formation then oozes into uh, the, the escape route you've made and that comes out uh, in this direction of course that technology about 30 years old when Sukkot was exploring they were kind of thinking this and had encountered the gas and there was nothing there that was going to come out in large volumes under pressure so they said well this is not viable but this kind of changed everything. <clears throat> if you can do this, then you can go into this kind of resource economically and get significant amounts of gas out. <clears throat> so the, the important thing, you know, that many people don't realize is firstly just how far down that is. You know, that's like three to four kilometers that you go down. And that whole way, you're drilling this very expensive hole, but you're getting nothing, basically. And then you hit this thin layer, which is maybe 20 meters thick, which is actually burying the, the gas. And if you had to go and drill down over here, you know, to get this, you know, 20 meter gas source, and then you had to move over there and drill down and get this 20 meters, that just wouldn't work at all. Whereas if you can go down and then go for a long way, three to five kilometers, in some instances, even 10 or more kilometers horizontally, that whole length is then generative rather than the, 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 the vertical bit. And um, that not only is what sort of drives the whole logic of this stuff, it also frees you up in some interesting ways from an environmental point of view. Because it then doesn't really matter exactly where you put your, your wellhead. You know, if you decide that the middle of the sweet spot is over here, and there happens to be river iron rabbits, their last you know, colony in the world happens to be there, you know, you don't have to put your wellhead on top be. of it. <laughs> you can put it over there. All right. Hot, or hot, if, hot, if we sure. if we found you know that the key place to, to get this was right under the town of Crawfrenet, under all those national monuments, you wouldn't set up your drill rig in the middle of the town square. You know, so this you know gives you a certain amount of freedom. The other interesting thing is, of course, you set up a wellhead here with your infrastructure, and you drill down and you go that way. And then while that one's producing, you're drilling down and going this way. And when that one dries up after actually a remarkably short period of time, like two years, you start pulling from this one. In the meantime, you're drilling from that one. So your actual surface footprint is not the kind of pictures that you see you know, in, in the newspaper of, of little you know, nodding wellheads every 100 meters. That just wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. These things are five or 10 kilometers apart. They're quite small. Uh, and you and you extract you know in multiple directions from it. So how do I minimize There's a one take okay, never mind. Okay. So it costs a lot of money to drill these holes. You know, it's, it's not a it's not a stratigraphic exploration hole, you know, a typical sort of diameter. It's at the top a humongous thing. It's in a seven, 70 centimeters because you've got to go down and you've got to line it and then you've got to go down further and you've got to line that, go down and down and down. So it's a great big hole. There isn't a drill, you know, rig in the country that could do that. You would have to bring this all in, you know, fr from scratch and whatnot. And the key for how long this works is not <clears throat> what yield you get here. It's what the shape of this drawdown curve is. And essentially, if your drawdown curve drops below a certain level 
within 18 months, you're never going to recover the money you invested in there. So the sensitivity of this is incredibly tight to the actual yield properties of, of the rock. And that's the bit of information we really don't have. So although we know there's gas down there, until you actually have those properties of the rock that can tell you what is the yield from you, and the, and the only way to really establish that is actually go down and do a test frack. Okay, to find out what is the yield characteristic um, from this exercise. Let me see if I can do it with this the way it's meant to uh, go. No, smaller one. Smaller one, smaller one. There we go. Need some beer. Okay, <laughs> so for purposes of this um, strategic assessment, so you do a strategic assessment when you don't know the details yet. It's different from an EIA. An EIA, you know you're going to do this at this place, Etc. Etc. Uh, and it has a, it has its role. Okay, but here we're trying to get the big picture, the helicopter view. And for that purpose, you don't know any of those details. And so what you do is you set up scenarios. You set up plausible stories. These are not predictions. We don't have a basis for making predictions. They are just kind of logical, coherent stories about what might happen. So the first thing to notice about this diagram is that even in the reference case, if there is no gas you know, discovered there at all. There's no gas development. The Karoo is not a static place. The Karoo is undergoing dramatic changes as we speak for a whole bunch of reasons, for demographic reasons, for land use change reasons. Everyone's getting out of sheep and into wildlife. Um, it's, uh, it's um, you know, the, the climate in southern Africa is warming up substantially, particularly in the, in the interior. So there's all kinds of things going on, regardless of whether you... Um, you know, do shale gas development or not. So this idea that the Karoo is this eternal, unchanging, you know, you know, place which, you, which, which no one can touch is simply not true. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the Karoo in addition to or instead of, of this. So kind of the one, is the, the, one, the one scenario is there's an exploration phase and it's discovered that there isn't a viable gas and then everything closes down and it's all finished in that kind of timeline. The second scenario is that they discover a small amount of gas, somewhere around about 5 trillion cubic feet. Big enough to be interesting from a local perspective, not big enough to excite you know, the whole world in terms of a game changer. And that would take up until you know, somewhere around about maybe 2030 or something to really come on stream, and it would be last maybe until 2040 or so, and then it would gradually phase out. You know, if they really hit the jackpot, you would then go and, and say, you know, you could develop more than one world field. And for that, you wouldn't be able to simply, under the small gas scenario, what you would do is you would take the gas that was delivered and actually on site convert that into electricity and feed it into the grid. You would have lots of distributed small turbines, which would burn it on site, and you'd feed it in, in, into the grid in a sort of a distributed way. The big gas scenario, you wouldn't be able to do that. There would be too much gas for that. So then you would have to have a gas infrastructure. You would have to have a gas to liquids or a, you know, some kind of thing to deal with, with, with that volume of gas. So those are the, 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 the four stories we talked about. In this kind of work, you always compare it against what would happen if nothing happened. Okay? And then you know, these, these, these three options. Oops. So... You're probably very familiar with this as well, but that's what a production, uh, you know, a wellhead would, would look like. It's about a, a, a kilometer, uh, at least a, a hectare in, in, in size. There's a bunch of people who live on site. Uh, there's a bunch of storage on site because you've got to store the fracking fluids in between fracks. And then, of course, there's lots of linear infrastructure because you've got a well field of these things. They have to be connected up. They have to be serviced. And in fact, the key impacts in many of the instances I'm going to talk about aren't the physical footprint. If you calculate the physical footprint, it's 0.0001% of the crew. It's, it's a complete non-issue. The issue is that this connected up with, with these, you know, a, a network of roads and pipelines and whatnot. And that's really what fragments the landscape and, and causes the, uh, the issues. So a typical production well field, this would be a, for the sort of low, the small gas size, it would probably all fit into about 30 kilometers by 30 kilometers. So you found a sweet spot, a little pocket of gas, 
Each of these would be one of those wellheads <coughs> I've shown. These are the sort of linear connections between them, and you would you know, pull it all into one place and, 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 and deal with it. Okay. So, you know, um, if there was <coughs> such a well field, if you're thinking of, you know, you're driving down to Cape Town um, at 120, I know you never go faster than 120. <laughs> you're driving to Cape Town at 120, you would pass through it in 15 minutes. Okay, just to give you an idea of the kind of scale that we're talking about. So everyone gets very excited about the fracking fluid, you know, that it's a, it's a, it's a seriously sort of toxic stuff. Uh, well, yes, you probably wouldn't want to drink it, uh, but most of it is water, and the rest of most of it is sand. And that's just a propant which you force into the cracks to keep them open so that they keep on... Delivering. And then there's a few other things in there. There's some biocides to stop the chokos from growing down there. And there's some, a few things uh, to, to, to make it flow better. And, you know, there's a huge mystique around fracking fluid. Because fracking, of course, was not invented by the big oil majors. It was invented by mom-and-pop operations. Uh, kind of under the radar in terms of regulations. Um, and in places like Oklahoma, basically, if you're in the oil industry, you can do whatever you like. Yeah, it's, a, it's pretty much like that. And so they were trying all sorts of stuff. If you want to put drain cleaner in there, if you wanted to, coffee grounds, you, you know, it, everyone was using whatever they could think of, you know, down these holes. And that's where this whole thing, you know, this fracking fluid is so carcinogenic, et cetera, et cetera. Under South African legislation, you have to disclose what goes into it. And that's kind of the cooking, the, you know, the, that, that's, the, the, that's the cookbook, you know, more or less of what, what goes into it. So the issue actually isn't the fluid itself. In the general perception is you're taking this toxic stuff, you're squirting it down a hole in, in the ground, it's leaking out sideways into all your drinking water, okay, and, you know, poisoning the, the, the ground. Really, that's not the main issue. It is possible, as you put it down under pressure, for it to leak out into our drinking water zone, which is the kind of 150 meters. Below that, we don't draw anything, it just would be impossible to draw any of our potable water from deeper than that. And, um, you know, so it is possible that you could have a poorly se sealed collar and you could get leak into that. It doesn't go very far because there's no lateral gradient. And the possibility of it, you pushing it down now four kilometers, squiggling its way up through four kilometers of rock up a little crack and squirting out at the top, you know, in a, in a, in a spring somewhere is actually just about disappearingly small you know so that's not the main issue the main issue is you push this 15 million liters of fluid down the hole because that's what it takes to fill the hole remember it's four kilometers long and it's this big okay that determines it and you then give it a, a you know a, 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 a squirt out there and it goes and then you've got to withdraw it because the gas won't come out if it's full with with liquid so you pump the stuff back out again and you get about 75 percent of it back and then you've got to keep it for your next frack. Remember, you're doing another hole, you know, from the same place, and, you, and you're recycling this water. So now you're sitting on the surface of the land with, you know, 10 million liters of fluid. Okay. So again, under South African legislation, that can't be in an open pond because of the problem. In the Karoo, we get these, it's a very dry place, but every now and then it isn't. Okay, we get these cuttle flows which dump, 200 millimeters of rainfall in 24 hours. And any structure like that would be quite prone to being breached. Okay, so it has to be stored in closed containers on the surface. And the problem is that when you pull it back up again, it not only contains all the goop that you put into it when you put it down, it contains all the goop that was down there and you've pulled back up. That's been isolated from the surface for, you know, 200 million years. It's mostly very saline. Okay, far too saline for you to spray it on the felt and you know as a as a you know a way of disposing of it, and it, in some instances is radioactive. We know that the Karoo is a radioactive province. We know that some of the waters that come up in places like Barrydale, you know, which is which are deep waters, that's why they're hot, you know, have a radioactive signal. So there's a possibility of radioactivity in there uh, 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 as well. Okay, so the issue is really, what do you do with this water? You have to store it carefully on the surface. You repeatedly use it. And when you've done your 10 or 15 fracks from a particular thing, that you then actually have to dispose of. And you can't dispose of it currently in the Karoo because technically it's radioactive industrial waste. 
Okay, you can't give it to the Beaufort West municipality and say, you know, you look after this. You actually have to reverse osmosis down until you've got a manageable quantity and you have to truck it back out again and dispose of it at a waste disposal site, site like, like Holton. Okay, so a couple of uh, issues around the energy system. So if we found gas, it would actually help out quite a lot. And South Africa is investing in a gas infrastructure, regardless of whether there's gas in the Karoo or whether there's gas offshore or not. We need gas for critical reasons, which I'll discuss in a moment. And the, the main one is this one here. People say, well, why are you going after gas when we know that solar and wind are coming in cheaply and you know they, 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 they're going to be the, the, the energy of the future? True, but with solar and wind are both intermittent sources, so you need actually filler power. This whole thing about base load, base load is actually a bit of a misnomer. What you actually need is the opposite of base load. It's things that you can turn on quickly to fill the gaps when you've got intermittency. And gas is absolutely the best thing for that. Right now we use diesel for that, and that's killing us. Okay, Cost-wise, emissions-wise, and everything else, gas would be so much better for that. So having gas actually increases the fraction of the mix we can have uh, in renewables, it doesn't decrease it. It means we're currently sitting at 30%. We could go to 50 or 60% if we had gas to fill in the holes, okay, which we would otherwise have. And, you know, the, the costs of gas are probably slightly more, um, if there was gas there, slightly more than, than wind, about the same as solar, significantly cheaper than, than, than coal. So what gas would do is it would displace coal out of the system, not displacing you know, solar and PV out of the system. We'll, uh, we'll talk later about the greenhouse gas emissions question, um, so I won't deal with that one then. And you know, the basic thing is that there is a gas master plan for South Africa. We need gas in the system. The question really is just where is it going to where is it going to come from? The other thing that comes up all the time is you know jobs, and this was sold very much of brand new industry, game changer. You know, going to provide all these jobs and whatnot. Well, it turns out it doesn't actually make a lot of jobs. And the jobs that it makes are not the jobs that are going to satisfy the, the unemployed in South Africa, the low-skilled unemployed. They're jobs for redneck you know, drillers from Oklahoma. Okay? They're not jobs for people doing you know, ordinary kind of un un unskilled work. It would be in the region, even under the big gas uh, scenario, it's less than 1,000 jobs. And when we look at the other activities going on in the Karoo, it's orders of magnitude more jobs. You know, farming employs 38,000 people in the Karoo, in, in our study area, not 1,000. Tourism, you know, is, is in the order of 10,000 people. And even the renewable energy uh, you know, business is, 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 is you know, employing a, a similar sort of number. So, you know, the, the, the job thing is a bit of a red herring. If we look at it as an economic sector, that's the kind of range of turnover. So that's not profit, okay? That's just this much gas multiplied by this price. You know, that's kind of the numbers we're talking about. So we're talking about you know, somewhere in the region of maybe 5 billion to maybe 20 billion uh, a, a year. You know, not small beer, okay? But also in the picture of the whole economy, actually not huge either. If we look at farming just in this area, it's in the five billion. So the same <coughs> order of magnitude as a small gas. And tourism is just a little bit behind that and of course growing much faster. Even the wind and solar industry right now is in the same order of magnitude. And the square kilometer array is in the same order of magnitude. So one of the little tricks that I teach my students is something I call order of, order of, <coughs> of, of, of magnitude modeling. Okay. And that is, you calculate these sort of numbers out. Now, if it had turned out that sh the shale gas was 100 times or even 10 times bigger than these other things, then you would say, let's not fuss with those other things. Shale gas is going to make them irrelevant. If shale gas was an order of magnitude 10 times smaller than those other things, then we would say, well, let's not even bother with it. Okay, but the very fact that all of these things are about the same order of magnitude means that they're going to be in competition with one another. So if you do this and it 
and it decreases if you if your development of gas decreases your farming capability or your tourism capability or your renewable energy capability or puts a you know a snooker up the square kilometer array any of those it just wouldn't make sense okay because you've just robbed Peter to pay Paul okay so that's the usefulness of that kind of very rough not particularly in this sector yeah. of the Karoo but are you factoring in the loss of coal mining jobs well you know it, we didn't because we had drawn a dotted line around our study line which excluded that. We, we can come back to the later. I think that we're going to lose job, coal mining jobs anyway, regardless of whether we you know, develop uh, gas or not. But we'll, we can discuss that you know, later. Of course, you know, what people get really hot <coughs> under the collar around in the Karoo context is the issue of water. And the issue is really there is no water in the Karoo. There is no perennial surface water in the Karoo. And there are some aquifers, they're not super, super big, and the near surface potable groundwater is already totally fully allocated. So wherever we have an aquifer, someone's got their dibs on it. And so if we were to take a significant amount out of that, it's got to come out of someone's share and, you know, there's just no share to go around. So people say, well, well, then it's an open and shut case. You can't possibly frack because there's no water to do the fracking. Well, the water that you need for fracking, although it sounds like a lot, you know, 15 million liters per hole, that's actually in the big picture of things, it's like an Olympic swimming pool. It's not a huge amount of water. It's about the size of a farm dam. So we're not actually talking about such a big amount of water. And the, the water would have to come from somewhere else, but it doesn't have to be potable fresh water. It could come, all the holes that have been drilled to date have discovered mm. water resources, not ones that you could drink because they're too deep and they're too saline. You could use that. Or you could truck it in. The amounts we're talking about are not in, impossibly large. Or you could even put in a pipeline from the sea. You know, so there are other sources of fluid that you could use. So in some senses, the criticality of water in the Karoo actually makes it a non-issue because you just simply can't touch the existing freshwater issue. And if you're going to do fracking development there, you've got to make another plan. You cannot use the existing water resources. There is a risk of groundwater contamination, which we've discussed already. You could have a, all kinds of freak events. You could have bad engineering. You could have all sorts of things. But it's quite small. If you look at the history, we've been in doing fracking around the world for nearly three decades. There are instances of groundwater pollution. They're actually quite a small fraction. Of the, of, the, of the total area uh, exposed. Biodiversity, the important thing to remember here is we think of the Karoo as that big boring place with nothing in it. From a biodiversity perspective, not true. You know, if most places in the world had a biodiversity resource like the Karoo, it would be their national treasure. Okay, there are about 4,000 species here. That's more species than you get in the whole of Europe, okay, or the whole huge chunks of North America. This is a biodiverse, rich place, okay? And a lot of that is endemic. In other words, it doesn't occur anywhere else. So you do have to be thoughtful about what you do. So we did a you know, very um, sophisticated <coughs> spatial analysis. And basically, legally, under current South African legislation, you would not be able to do even exploration in these green areas. In the red areas, you would not be able to, you could do exploration, but you wouldn't be able to develop it if it occurred there. In the orange areas, yeah, you, you know, you'd have to jump through some pretty serious hoops to get that right. And basically, you'd have to work in the white areas. So it doesn't mean that there's no place that you could, um, that you could put down a, 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 a well field. You, you could, given you know, the sort of degrees of freedom there, but you would have to be really quite highly constrained. The other issue that we know occurs with fracking is an increase in small intensity tremors. There is no real belief that that translates to an increase in magnitude five kind of events. You know, the fact that you've got lots of these small events uh, doesn't mean that you suddenly, when you sort of grease the system, lubricate the system, that you suddenly get you know, macro events. Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, let me finish, just let me finish this slide. Is that the previous slide? No, the, yes it is. Yes, okay. so, so the rectangle is our study area, which okay. was, was constrained. And the particular area that they're looking at, okay, is actually seismically really <coughs> one of the more stable parts of the world. It's on a you know, ch chunk of, of, uh, of the Earth's surface that is not 
super seismic reactor. You know, R R Ray is, the, is our specialist here, and I'm sure you can say a great deal about this. One of the interesting things to me, of course, is that cluster there, which is just the gold mining cluster. You know, so you know, uh, extractive industries do create earthquake risk. Okay, Frac fracking is not unusual, not not you know exceptional in in, 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 in that regard. The, the the issues that are probably have come out as the most critical ones internationally, where this kind of exploitation has taken occur, has really related to this issue of the social fabric. So we know that extractive industries, because they are non-renewable, have a boom-bust cycle. And that's exactly what we see all over South Africa at the moment with the platinum belt or the gold. You, you know, for a, for a century, everything is, is absolutely wonderful. And then it runs out. And if you haven't made a plan B, okay, you've got a problem. You've got all these people there with nothing to, to, to do. And fracking is very much like that, except more so, because remember that that individual well only delivers for about two years, and then you're going to put down another one. So in fact, you condense this whole boom and bust cycle into a short period of time. And that in and of itself, you know, is a manageable issue, but the problem is the expectations that go with that. So now we've discovered gas, and we have 60% youth unemployment. You know, 59% of those up roots and go there in case there's a job. Okay, regardless of the fact that there actually really aren't jobs, you're still going to go there because what are your options? And so you get massive influxes of people. And then, of course, the folks who are already there say, you know, who's this guy? You know, I wanted that job. He doesn't speak my language. He's, no, you know, he's, he's got a completely different you know, worldview. And so you get all kinds of issues there. Crime increases. The main thing that the farmers worry about, the farmers aren't worried about water, they're not worried about, you know, disturbance, whatnot. They worried about, they've been there for, you know, many hundreds of years, many of those families. They know everyone, everyone, this is a stable community, there is a bit of stock theft, but you kind of under, you know, sort of a controllable thing. Suddenly, you've got 10,000 people from somewhere else moving in there. Wandering all over your land <laughs> saying, I'm doing seismic surveys and whatnot. You've got no control. That's what worries them, is that kind of you know, I I impact. Those people you know, around, the, around the towns put a huge stress on the municipal services. Already we're seeing that, uh, not because of fracking, but because of... There's a really interesting gradient across the crew in that study area of ours, which goes from sort of east of Kraft Renet through to you know, basically Toes River. There's a, a really interesting uh, sort of bright lights gradient across that. People coming out of the Eastern Cape, heading for the Western Cape, simply because services work better. And so you're getting a large number of people settling around these small towns, which weren't ever, you know, their clinics and their sewerage systems and whatnot, were never designed to deal with an extra 1,000 people or 2,000 people who are coming there who are unemployed. Okay, we've got a huge strain on, on municipal services. If there were gas, some people would do well out of it. People running, you know, in the hotel industry, people running, you know, the gas services industry, they're going to do well. And so they're going to get wealthy, and there's going to be a bunch of people who are going to just have to deal with the negative consequences, but none of the positive consequences, and that's an inequity issue. There are some workplace health, workplace health issues. The biggest one is silicosis. The fine sand, you put down the hole, okay, it's not in itself toxic, but if you breeze it in, okay, you've got a problem. So there are some you know, standard issues there. The key public health issues always around the world with this sort of thing are largely around things like STDs, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, that, that, that's a big sort of thing. And increased road, road access. Massively increased road traffic with you know, the, 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 the trucking and whatnot. And that's really probably the way the single STD is largest in that area. <laughs> So that's the square kilometer array. And is that me or someone else? <laughs> <laughs> Ray should phone you again. That's 10 bucks. <laughs> and that's, that's Sutherland, which of course has the, one of the largest optical uh, uh, astronomy instruments uh, in, in the world. And when they won the sort of square kilometer array, um, they declared you know, a vast area of the Northern Cape a... Uh, advantage area, so you can't have any electromagnetic radiation in there. And they did that without any fanfare, without any impact assessment, without actually anything whatsoever. Only now coming to implement it and say, oh shit, 
Yeah. Now, we've got a bit of a problem because, for instance, it crosses the N1. So, in principle, you can't drive down that with a spark fired car. You know? So, no one really thought this through. And we were really surprised when we said to them, okay, tell us what your specifications are. You know, how far away from one of these receivers do we have to be and what can we emit? They had absolutely no idea. No one had done the sums. And they're only now being forced to do an, an, an assessment. And in fact, they came to us and said, you know, it was really interesting being involved in the assessment, so that's how you do it. <laughs> okay. So they're busy running it at, 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 at the moment. So that's you know, a, kind of uh, an issue. I think it's a, solu a solvable issue. Um, you know, the design of the square kilometer array is it's this set of spiral, logarithmic spirals, you know, and there's, there's receiving stations at increasing distance. It goes from there, that's the next receiving station, that's the next one, the next one would be there. And once you get down to that level, you can actually plot out exactly what can be where and how emittive can it be and how would you shield it, etc., etc. So I think it's a, a, a soluble issue, but one that, you know, hadn't really been on anyone's uh, this is kind of what a, a situation would look like, you know, in the um, in, in the career. It is a visual intrusion, um, so you would really have to be thoughtful about how you would locate such things in relation to the key tourism infrastructure and routes. You wouldn't put it, you know, kind of on the I don't know, you know, the Snewberg Pass or you know something like that. That would that would just be kind of stupid. Um, and, and, and one of the issues are probably greater at night than in the day, okay? And again, there's things you can do about that in relation to, for instance, the optical um, um, obs observation. You can use lighting, which doesn't just shine up in, you know, it's, it's sort of lighting where you need it and the amount that you need it, non-flaring, etc., etc. Okay, now here's where we get into the really difficult stuff, because there's a whole cluster of people and it's mostly the people who who absolutely ag against fracking and when you burrow it down they will usually say well uh, you know we're worried about the water and so you unpack the water issues and say this is how you would deal with the water issues and they say no no actually it's the biodiversity you you know you say well no you wouldn't be allowed to do it in any of these biodiversity areas and say, oh no no it's the earthquakes and say well actually there isn't an earthquake and you finally 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 get it down and the root issue is this thing called sense of place you know there's there is an irreducible feeling that I just don't want that. It violates my sense of what's right and proper. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's just not an acceptable thing in that circumstance. And, you know, the, the sort of idea is, is, is the idea of the nuxate, okay, for any non-South Africans here, the nothingness, okay? The Karoo is the nothingness. And the moment you put a something into the nothingness, you don't have a nothingness anymore. <laughs> and that's a very powerful idea. The, 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 the key thing about sense of place, and don't dismiss it, it's easy to giggle about, okay? When we think about the only other major mining development in South Africa that was came to a grinding halt was the... St. Lucia, you know, titanium mining. You know, this is going back 30 years. It was the first big environmental study I did. I was involved in that. It wasn't canned on any technical ground. It was canned on the ground that there were just enough people in South Africa who said, we don't want it. We don't want it. We don't care. We don't care if you can fix it. We don't care about it. We do not want it. That's that. Okay. So if you poo-poo this stuff, you're going to come short. Okay, you have to take it seriously and engage with it and understand it. So we didn't do a hugely good job of that because it's difficult. There's no researchers in here. There's no data. It's a, it's a tough thing to do. The important thing is that there isn't only one sense of place. There are lots of senses of places, and they're kind of quasi-overlapping. There are a whole bunch of people, me included, who are really attracted by the Nuxate, actually. All right? There's a whole bunch of people who, the, you know, the quicker you can get through the Karoo, the better. You know, it's just, a, I don't want any nuxate out there. There's a whole bunch of people who are far more attracted by the possibility of a job than the possibility of staring at the night sky. You know, so we have to understand that, that there's a whole variety of, of viewpoints on this, and we don't really understand how, how big those viewpoints are, how, how many people are represented, how transient they are over time, are these fixed or do they evolve over time, okay? How could you mitigate it? Is it even possible? And, um, uh, and, and, and in the ultimate analysis, to be quite brutal about it, how much power 
do each of those groups have? Because if a group is firmly convinced, you know, about, you know, this idea of the sort of pristine Karoo, they might be small, but if they are politically connected and wealthy and can hire lawyers, okay, you've got a, you've got a problem right there. You better deal with it. The interesting thing about this is that when we recruited experts to do this assessment, obviously the seismics, we're going to find the top seismic people. We've never appointed just one person. You appoint a bunch of people so that they can, you know, keep control of each, each other. If you want a biodiversity thing, you go and ask some, you know, people like me who know about biodiversity. When you come to sense of place, there are no sense of place experts. So we went to people like artists and poets and writers. Okay. They have a sense of place. They understand the concept of sense of place. It's an important thing. I used the big word in the beginning of this transdisciplinarity. That's what transdisciplinarity means. It means you go beyond your narrow set of, oh, there's these kind of skills, the ones that you would find in a university. To think, who knows about this? Okay, so when we talk about this, we're using, for instance, quite a lot of indigenous knowledge. Okay, we're using local knowledge. When we did the farmer stuff, the agricultural thing, yes, we had people with PhDs in agronomy. We also had farmers. Okay, so you go to where the knowledge is and acknowledged to be, not necessarily to the guy with a PhD. All right, so briefly about the climate change issue. Everyone gets very excited over the fact that for a given BTU of output, or, or kilowatt hour of output, you produce twice as much emissions from coal than you do from gas. So if you were to substitute coal, uh, in South Africa is like 80, 90% of our energy comes from coal, if we were to substitute that with gas, our emissions would go down by half. Yeah, that's a fantastic thing, isn't it? However, the amount of gas that we're talking about actually would actually only make a half a percent difference to South Africa, okay? Or here, two percent. That's the first issue. So, yes, that is, you know, the potential there, but it's, a, it's really quite marginal. But the key issue is, is that calculation assumes you don't have any fugitive losses of methane. Methane is more or less 20 to 30 per times more powerful than CO2 on a molecule per molecule basis as a trapper of solar radiation. So a tiny leak of methane adds up to a hell of a lot of CO2. Okay, And it turns out that about a 2% leak would completely wipe out that benefit. Okay, And the industry standard turns out to be around about 2%. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, there was a report just two weeks ago that recalculated from the United States, it's actually 3%. Okay. So, also not completely unmitigatable. It turns out that almost all of the leaks are big ones. You know, so it's not the sort of general ooze. It turns out that most of your leak comes from a couple of big blowouts. And so if you can get on top of that stuff, you're doing okay. And it's not actually in the industry's interest to have leaks because that's profits you know that are, that are leaking away so you know one could possibly address this thing but it is incredibly sensitive technically very sensitive because it's a tiny amount makes all the difference all right so in summary viable shale gas in the crew i'm not putting any money <coughs> i think it's actually quite unlikely for fundamental geological geophysical reasons okay if it is there the development that would take place is actually decades down the track. There's all the exploration, a decade's worth of exploration. Then there's all the development that would have to be done. And everywhere along that pathway, there's decision points and exit points where people can decide, is this what we want? Is it viable? Is it what we want? A misconception is that the government makes those decisions. The government's not going to make those decisions. Okay, This will be essentially the public and the industry making those decisions. The government does not have the expertise or the money to invest in this thing. If it is viable, people will invest. If it's not viable, people won't invest. And that's really where the, the, you know, the kind of you know, d decision point comes. And then you know, around the public, it's around whether they're willing to accept um, you know, what goes with fracking or, or, or not. Okay. The next logical step okay, is, I think, a no-regrets exploration. We don't know what the situation is. You need to do more exploration. And that is also a multi-step project. You need to understand, first of all, you know, the proper seismics and the remote, you know, remotely sensed stuff, the, the aeromagnetics and whatnot. You have a better picture of the Karoo. If you don't find gas, and I actually think it's quite unlikely that you would find, you know, significant amounts of gas, you haven't lost, okay, I mean, I'm a scientist. I believe in knowledge. I believe that you, 
the more you know, the, be the better you are. So this is a kind of a no regrets investment. We would know more about the stratigraphy of the crew, about its structure and whatnot, even if it did you know, cost us uh, you know, some money and we didn't get a prize at the end of it. And in resolving some of the things that we have big question marks around the impact. So that's kind of what the agenda should be for the next decade is let's actually find out let's not you know get into a whole kind of excited mode here let's find out what the situation is is there anything to be excited about and what are the key concerns and how would we address them and so that's sort of what's you know uh, the, the, the 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 kind of um, you know way going forward it's gone very quiet okay with um at, at, at oil prices, you know, around the sort of $50 a barrel, none of this stuff would make any sense whatsoever. And, you know, the big oil majors sort of walked away from this. It could be that they walked away from it after looking at, it, you know, taking a hard look at the economics and saying, no, this is just not, not real. It could be a negotiating tactic as well, saying, well, things are becoming too difficult for us here. Let's pretend we're not interested. I, I, I really don't know. But, you know, if the oil price does spike above a kind of 120, where it's been before, suddenly even these sort of marginal things become possible again. And the, in that circumstance, to me, it would be better to know than not to know. And that's why I would support that, that kind of approach. And then you make a decision. You put your legislation in place. As a result of the assessment, we know what the sensitive points are. We know what the kind of conditions would have to be, you know. And then you make your decision. You know, is this something we want to do or we don't want? Okay, so now it's open for question time. If you, if you, and, and, and I don't know, is everyone onto their second glass yet? <laughs> <laughs> I can finish my first.